Greetings, greetings, market rebels. Welcome to this week's macro measure. I'm Wayne, my partner, friend Ryan is working on the outlook for this upcoming week and we'll be referencing last week's outlook. So uh, please take a look at that in all the newsletters that go out. And really Ryan gets that out individually uh, on Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. So anyway, it is October 30th, 2022. It's a little after, I think, 11 a.m. here on the East Coast. Let's just do the old uh, disclaimer. There it is. There's our disclaimer. Trusty disclaimer there. And then we will flash our intellectual property rights notice. And just an audio reminder that if you're interested in getting together with Brian and Bill, Johnson, AJ, John, and Pete, I think will be there. There's an event coming up, I believe, in Florida, I think in Miami, in the not too distant future. So you can check that out at marketrebellion.com. And that should do it for that part that we have to cover. So now we can start out looking at last week's outlook. And this is really, I, I think, good to, to start out here because this can really show you how you can get some things right and some things wrong. And I think last week we were coming into the week thinking, okay, uh, there's a couple little ca possible caveats. One is everyone seemed to be bullish uh, or suddenly, right, to overstate it, but you get the idea. And then the other thing was, was, was the action we saw the Friday prior, was that legitimate action or not? That should we rely on that given how big of a expiration it was for options and so on and so forth. So I think the general idea that we had coming into the week was probably in the absence of news, you probably try to go higher and then see what happens with the big time earnings and then go from there. So the benefit of the doubt we were giving the bulls, but thinking that the earnings of the big names would potentially dictate the outcome. And that was somewhat right to start out with, I think, but then this is why it's so tough, right? You get that bullish action anyway, despite Microsoft and Alphabet and a lot of the other big names, of course, Amazon and Meta, uh, all with, I think as a package, you'd have to be fair about, to be fair about it. You'd have to say, well, that's, that, that wasn't that impressive. It was probably pretty poor, but again, we rallied strongly anyway. So a lot of those, a lot of those turns that we saw in the caveats, uh, didn't seem to matter. They just rally them anyway. And that kind of gets back to what we were talking about in terms of, well, we didn't mention this, but I think like end of the month would be one thing, right? But really the seasonality that was in the outlook and in the newsletters last week. So here's your midterm composite uh, seasonal performance there in black. And here's where we are for the year in red. And you, excuse me, you can see that how how this is the favorable time, right? Generally, the most favorable time. Um, then we had a breakdown, and that was a little bit more interesting in terms of the midterm election year and what's happened since 1946. And this is all years, all midterm years, first mid first midterm year, and so on and so forth. But get the idea that laid off. There's generally a shift which we just were in, of course. And this is what we were anticipating a few weeks back, that this would probably start because we had been sold off into it. But they started, I think, just a week earlier than I thought they would. I thought we'd have one final whoosh, lower as we've been calling it, and then go from there uh, back up. But again, the guys, uh, these guys are really good at <laughs> what they do. And they started a little bit sooner than, than I thought they would. But that's why you just have to when you see that momentum shift, you've got to go with it. But I wanted to lay the foundation for this seasonality a little bit, a little bit more deeply, and just kind of note some things here. This is from Z Red, uh, one of our Rebel Rebel uh, Pit guys, and uh, he put he put this out to us I think over a week ago. But we did note this during the I think maybe even last week in Macro Measure, but. Here you have the VWAP uh, turning on the VWAP buy machine, right? Effectively, right, this is where the buybacks come in. They were returning. You can see on the calendar how the distribution of buyback blackout event exits ends, right? So they'll be able to start buying their stocks. And interestingly, right, uh, the, a report came out this week that I think Meta had just bought an incredible uh, number of shares at 300. And you can see, of course, where it's trading now just We've been railing against this using 
the shareholder money to buy back shares uh, to artificially uh, manage things and really pad the uh, pad the net worth of the board members. Uh, it's it's really just you know it's it's in your face stuff. It just gets uh, really old. But interestingly enough, right with the buybacks, uh, the the corrective action we've seen and the buyback information that's about to excuse me accelerate. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say information, but the buyback, uh, what would we call that one? Buyback uh, potential, I guess we could call it. There's this in, right now, right? We've got this massive insider buying the highest in over uh, 10 years, right? So that's quite interesting. And then over here, you have fund manager cast position is now at the highest level, supposedly, Right again, I can't vouch for all these. I haven't, I can't verify these myself, but this is what's out there. You've got to go back to 01 to find these fund managers sitting on bigger, bigger cash. And so you combine the seasonality, you combine the uh, where things are, you're not quite at extreme greed or, and so on and so forth, as, as seen here. Again, not, not the greatest measure, but at least it's something to go by. And then over here, you can see the sentiment is shifting. Okay, it's definitely getting a little bit better than it had been, but um, it's still well below the historical averages, right where we are right now. So there's a lot of room for improvement here before you would even get into a say fearful situation. And so that's really interesting too, because that means right that there could be still. I've been making this case that you've got the buybacks, you've got the seasonality, you've got the Fed, you've got the election coming up. And there could be a lot of folks that just don't believe this rally, which I, I can understand why. But what that does if, is, is if they can string things together a little bit longer and it starts looking like you're in, you know, you're at mid November and it starts looking as if this market's really holding together, that could bring a lot of people, if there is a significant rally between now and then, that could bring a lot of people, again, off the so-called sidelines and almost, in their minds, force them to put money to work, which could then, you know, create, a, a, for bulls at least, a virtuous cycle. And and sometimes we do get that, I think, and it, it I think we had that a few years ago, and it just, it imploded shortly thereafter, once you got into the new year, much like this year started off with the markets pinned at highs, probably ridiculously so. And uh, then we've had this year, you know, but they're trying to mop up the year, trying to mop up their Christmas bonuses. They've got a lot of things in their favor. So we can't, we can't ignore that. That's just a, well, whatever I had there in Twitter is gone. So I had something else that I'd save there, but oh, well, no big deal. We'll move on. Somehow I must have misclicked something. Anyway, what I did want to show before we get into the charts is this right and a lot of you will recognize this but we got back up there on the percent of stocks above the 20-day average put this in the rebel pit i think this week and so you've seen this before but uh let's take a look at some of the others that are on their way towards these like higher higher levels right not quite there really yet on the percent stocks above the 50-day but working up there right and so again i don't think this is overdone I don't think that it's, uh, it's, I think, I don't think technically it's at, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's in jeopardy at the moment. And I'll talk more about that naturally as we go through a few more charts, but here you are about the 200 day. So it's, it's interesting that it's sort of quadruple or double bottom, whatever you want to call it. So you can sort of see a W in here and they're working this way back up and uh, it hasn't looked this good really since before that that August uh, swoon we started, well, I should say the swoon that started in August, but getting back up there, not there quite there yet. But that's the quick look at all the background and uh, ancillary information. Here's the chart of the SPY. And what I would try to note for everyone is that those vertical red lines are equivalent on the MMTW, the percent of stocks above the 20. When it's gotten very high, we've been, and I think this one's, yeah, good, there you go. So there's the start of the year. We were very high on that. We declined. 
Here, we got high on it again. We declined a little bit. Here, certainly, it was a great, great thing to keep an eye on. A good thing to keep an eye on for sure there. A little bit early here, but worth keeping an eye on. Once again, it appeared here. Again, worth keeping an eye on. Then it appeared here recently, a few days back. But as always, much like I trade gaps, um, much like, I, well, I should say, much like I factor in gaps to what I like to do, and much <clears throat> like I handle trading reversal trades, I don't like to go against something until I see some signs of exhaustion or especially some sort of momentum reversal. And you, it would be really hard to make the case that there's been a momentum reversal here at this point, because we have been noting this, right, that RSI has been improving. We've been noting that on the, on the bullish days, the, the, the uh, volumes perked up generally a little bit more than the bearish days. And you can see there, Thursday was, your, was, a, was a bearish session. And you can see the volume dropped off from Wednesday. And then you can see that the volume picked back up again on Friday. Now, one, we were discussing, I believe, that this resistance line, this support line were really contained a, uh, an ex a minor expanding wedge or an expanding wedge to a lesser degree. It was really embedded within this larger one here that I'll click and make blue in both cases. So we're still operating with the same structural, uh, structural situation we have been pretty much since this started to trace itself out earlier in the year. And I still think you're in this. Now, we did note a few weeks ago that we were outside of our Bollinger Bands, the lower Bollinger Band there in that green dots, and that uh, they'd like to bring things back in once they've gone out there and there's been an excursion for a while. It's, it's very, obviously, it's very common. But that also, excuse me, when they broke it out of here, that also became interesting that they took things through because this is certainly a, a, a low that's well off of this lower this lower area down here where we'd expect the expanding wedge support to come back in. So they didn't play any games there. Uh, they burst it through. Now, what I would like to highlight too is they burst through our resistance right there in the, in the blue line, brought it back just about to there, like to the 10, to the 20, generally speaking, and then jammed it. Now, interestingly, right, this is why I think this week's going to be a tough call because you got through this key high you came, hit the 50 on the first uh, first move up, pulled back after trying to go through it and failing, pulled back right to that former uh, resistance level, found support where you'd expect, and then you, you're going again. <clears throat> so is it a case where even though, and I'll, I'll show some, you know what, I'll actually not show these. Let me just try to discuss them so we save time. But bottom line is that, if you look at the S&P 500 via the SPY as our proxy, when we chart that just for the record so that folks can possibly trade off of it or like to track it um, a little bit more than the index, uh, index products, but the SPY on some of the heavier duty intraday time frames uh, that I like to look at, a lot of these things that are cycling high, right? So it finished overbought on the intradays. Now on the daily, right, which we're looking at right here, I think it's only, yeah, I was gonna say it's only, it's near 60 right now. So does it have room to go? Absolutely, it does in my mind. Uh, but I do think that you have uh, the chance, right, for a little bit of a pullback, again, not knowing any news over the weekend of what, what, what may arrive by Monday, Monday's opening. But in the news neutral scenario, I think it could pull back to the 50 one more time and then try to go bust through the 100 just because it's short term overbought. But I wouldn't get too caught up in that. You could see that the 10, 15 and 20 in white, red and light blue are all now curling back up in with a positive slope. And that happened prior because they're they're meant to right there. That's part of what you expect them to do is to to curl up clearly right sooner than the longer term based moving averages. And then we see what happens from there. And we thought it would try to work. It's, it, the spies would try to work their way back towards these SMAs and they did. If they got through here and they did, um, we thought it would be very hard for that to happen. Excuse me. Uh, based upon pretty awful stuff coming out of the big names in tech, but it didn't matter. Right. And that's the thing. Like I thought this scenario was more likely to happen. 
if things were pretty solid there, but it, it happened anyway. So once again, uh, never, never easy to get everything right. There are some gaps that I pointed out on cocktail hour uh, that could still matter. And so I wouldn't rule those out uh, at all. Uh, and remember the gridlock factor is, is something that a lot of people bemoan, uh, but Wall Street has tended to like the gridlock uh, in my recollection. And I think that's the general consensus on that. So there's more to go. If we look at the weekly, there's more to go here. I think it's probably a little bit better of a view, but it's a little tricky now, right? Because we've, we've had that big move in the stocks above their 20 day. And that percent is jammed up to levels that preceded corrective action right the other way, which would of course in this case be bearish. But, uh, and the, but the seasonality and all the other factors we covered are supporting them doing more. It's just that in the short term, I think they're overbought, but look at this weekly. On the weekly, the RSI is only reading about 48 or 49. So that's telling you right in a little bit bigger picture than the daily, that this is nowhere near overbought uh, at this point. It's really neutral. And if it does continue to ascend, right, the 50 and 100 weeks will be waiting for it up there near, let's just say 415-ish, which is just, just about where the little bit less than that is where our resistance line is now for this expanding wedge, just corrective action that we've seen pretty much all year long. So that's my general take. Now, what I would say is, look, uh, Powell did not, Powell and company did not seem to like the market shrugging off their warnings. And uh, they seem to, at least publicly, uh, complain that the market was not getting their full message. Uh, we've seen the market pull this maneuver off where they doubt the Fed's going to be strong on inflation uh, for longer, and they keep anticipating a pivot. Now, they've been wrong so far, they're dead wrong, but will they be wrong again this time? Well, this is the week we find out. Don't forget that this is that's probably the big thing of the week is the FOMC, the fallout that comes from that. That's very hard to predict. I really have no idea. Uh, I would still say that my way of looking at it is I would give the bulls their be the benefit of the doubt until conditions change. If they drive things up dramatically in front of the Fed and we're hitting 70 plus 75 on a lot of the indexes, uh, major, well, I should say the major index ETFs and some sector ETFs and a lot of stocks, et cetera, then they may have just ran it too far too fast. Uh, if they pull things back and chill out for a little bit and then decide to go after the Fed, you know, that, that would make me believe it's more, it would be more sustained. It would be easier to sustain, but I think you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. We, we talked about it last week that that's the approach we were going to take. And um, right now the bulls, I don't think there's any doubt that in the short term, the bulls are in control. I still think for, for personally, which is not saying much because I just don't have the time to compete with wall streets, research desk, but I still personally think that we're in a longer term bear market, but uh, we don't, that doesn't really factor all that much right in the, in our short term trading. I'm just say, saying for the record, I still feel that way about everything that I know to this point. Uh, but in the short run, we, we've traded these all year long, these, these nice little pops that the markets had. And we tried to get back in, of course, on the short side with all the services too. And I think overall, a lot of the rebels, market rebels, have done very well. Uh, this hasn't. This is not easy stuff to trade compared to stuff like this. You know, I prefer this for um, myself and for uh, all the market rebels that are in our services and so on and so forth. Because I just, this is great. I mean, you can find, uh, you can just keep looking around for stocks that are ready that have laggards that haven't participated. Find those. You you find winners that have been doing really well that have had minor pullbacks and then. When the market's ready to go, you, you get in. Uh, it, it works extremely well, but we're not in that, right? We're in this, and this is definitely a lot more challenging. So I think if folks are handling this well, they're, they're doing a great job because it's not easy, but you have to remain open-minded. I think you, you know, one of the things is let's just call it, we said we were going to be objective last week. We tried to be objective every week, and you had to give the bulls their, their due last week uh, in the end. The only caveat being, I think, just Friday -ish issue, um, and that everybody flip, those are the caveats and everybody flipped bullish. But again, giving them their due, they, they even sh shrugged off 
some pretty rough earnings news out of the big the big timers, which we all know now. So let's move on and work our way through. Uh, we've got the diamonds, which I think look better than other things. They're really close already to the 100. Oh, excuse me, I'm on the weekly. Let me get back to a one year daily. But they already look good. They already, there it is. <clears throat> They're already through the, through the 200, excuse me there already, right? So they've already done extremely well. You have to be a little concerned, I think, about the vertical nature of what the diamonds have done. Uh, that's a little too vertical for my taste. I, uh, that concerns me. Uh, you've got a 72 on your RSI. Uh, I get that uh, these are so supposedly the blue chips, blah, 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 but still definitely concerning to me the nature of that ascent. I think you're you're really shooting up there now. I mean, if you look at this and without very much of a pullback over the course of last week. So mm, could keep going, of course. There's a little gap up here. Uh, we can't fail to note that. I'll just put that on there for us now. But yeah, I think you, you've, got, you've gotten a little ahead of yourself there. It's another reason why it might make a little sense for them to pull this thing back a little bit for the for start of the week and then see what happens there. You know, with the Fed and how that's going to be interpreted. But um, now we'll move on to the QQQ, which has really been uncharacteristically right, uh, the laggard uh, out of a lot of these. But you have this sort of double bottom, but you know, nice little reversal there, strong reversal after going outside of the lower Bollinger several weeks ago, reversing strongly back in. But that kind of puts together just. Uh, it's a throw over, whatever you want to call it, but kind of makes the case that this level here at that 270 ish, maybe 265, 270 is a big deal. And then this thing's working its way up. So the fact that it, I think, right, this is what I like to see. I think a lot of people like to see this where you break out, you come back, find support near your resistance line, form a resistance line on the 10, 20, 15 complex, and then you try to go. And my guess would be, that if they can spin whatever comes out of the Fed this week in a positive way, I think there's going to be a lot of yahoos. They've got a lot of money. The sentiment's still bad. And I think there's so many people that are not anticipating a rally that you just can't rule out at all that these guys could run this thing dramatically over the next, say, six weeks or so, six to eight weeks. I just don't think you can rule that out in the face of all things that are reasonable and logical, maybe they would be able to do that. But we all know that they're, 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 they're great when it comes to self-preservation and bailing out their own you know, year-end bonuses or at least making themselves look a lot better than down, down here, right? So that's broken out. Let's give it a chance. Let's see what happens. But uh, it's got a lot to make up. Now, with rates being high, right, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, typically for tech stocks to just go on a tear. But again, uh, there it's an obsession. You know, there's, there's a FOMO obsession there. People can't get enough of them. Fund managers can't get enough of them. They'll try to make the argument they're getting super bargain prices. And may, maybe they are, right? It, it, that may be true. So IWM, the small caps, these were uh, something I was looking to catch up. I call it catch up. I think a lot of people do. I felt that these were should be catching up a little bit more. They finally put the move together on Friday that I thought they should have been doing more of, but hey, that's the way it works. They got bogged down there with that rust colored 50, one, sorry, 150 SMA after getting through the 100 in white and the gold uh, 50, they hit the 150 and it stopped it in its tracks for a couple of sessions. It then re-energized on Friday after bouncing off the 100 and really went. And so that's really a fresh this sort of bull uh, baton handoff, right? The bulls reestablished themselves. They've, they've only, they're only really into one day of fresh control. My bull bear counter is giving them six because of the way the math works. And it's true, right? It's also true that they took over here and then they, uh, the bulls held, we could say, there nicely after a good little initial pop. And then they're looking like they're ready to go again. And I think that's a spot that if, this, if the rally keeps going, I think these are going to 
be able to catch up to the spies more so. So they're a little bit of, in my book, they're, they're kind of a little bit of a laggard, I guess you would say. And I would, until they get overbought, uh, I think as long as the market's running, they're going to try to continue to go because they have, you could see here on this low, there was positive divergence there. They just keep getting better readings on RSI as they move it up. Um, and it looks like to me, there should be at least one more little push here uh, before these, uh, before this, this is done for now. But there was good volume on Friday. You can see there in the green bar. Uh, as I've said, the volume sort of flipped around when uh, the bulls have really stepped in of late and that's changed the short term complexion. So that's really your big, your big view, quick view on those. Uh, let's take a look at other things. We'll take a look at the dollar, which started coming off and then it found some support. And uh, at the lower end of uh, this channel, we've been, uh, we've had in place for a while. You'll notice that the trend you'd have to say is, I guess still up right overall, but because your longer term moving averages are saying that your eyes are saying that from the price action, but Hey, if this thing comes up here, just and starts to roll over and fail again, and it doesn't even make, really make it to the middle middle area of this up ascending channel. This thing could then could then finally be in trouble. There might be more of a pullback. And as we said before, the dollar is, was really overbought in many ways and just kept powering. Uh, the TNX this also started to pull back a little bit. So the yields are pulling back now. This twenty day was pretty decent. Act, uh, in terms of calling like support or th this has done a good job of riding above it. It's now not very far from there. So I think you have to be, if you see that start to really drop below Thursday's low, there's definitely some room in the dollar as there really is in the, in the DXY. So I think this pullback could start to get a little bit more uh, interesting. Just keep an eye on that low there at 39.11. If you start seeing the TNX, that yield drop below there, that would be quite interesting. But again, this could all change so quickly as we all know. That's why like charting so close and trading close to these, these events like this FOMC meeting and all these earnings that are coming out. This is a period that I just can't stand because a lot of times the news reactions just, uh, they kind of help good technical setups unravel. So I think the technical setups are just much more reliable when we're not in this mode. You have to be really nimble, much more nimble, I think, during this kind of earnings season uh, stuff. And of course, with the, when you're near the Fed, it's just almost better off not trading and just waiting for the Fed nonsense to end. But then again, there are some times where they, instead of just chopping around, they do put pre-Fed moves together and if you're not, if you rule those out, you might be missing out. So it's never, again, never an easy call. Here's the VIX we, that we've been looking at all year. And after being near the high side of our range, we think it's working its way, obviously, back towards the middle part of the range. And if they, I would expect if the gang is able to take this ignition they've got in the last week and a half and extend this according to the seasonality and get their gridlock, get the Fed to do what they want. Uh, yeah, I would expect by the end of the year, then, you know, we would just keep going back down and just, you know, do, doing the old mean reversion fully to the other side. So, but that's, you know, that's really been under pressure. Obviously the VIX, the VIX was not buying it much like I think some, some signs in the bond market that we really can't cover, but they're also not buying the Fed pivot story. Uh, so much, but equities are always willing to buy anything bullish in my mind versus versus bonds. Equities are going to try to work with it. Here's your real estate trust we've been looking at. They've got this looking a little bit better. I think things just got pretty much smashed, right? As we said in this one, this is looking better. And I think if it takes out this high right here, you've got to give it, say, look, it likely goes up towards these lows. There's a little bit of a little bit of a gap gap right there and then that's your 50. So I think there's a little more potential there. You can see the shorter term SMAs are all starting to swing. You were recently really crushed. We noted that, but 
it's it's not overdone on the RSI. So again, I would give that the benefit of the doubt, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense to you. I would do that LQD. We've been charting this one. This is another thing that got pretty hit hit pretty hard for a while, and now they're trying to work this back up, and it's getting above the twenty. So probably the next high that it takes out. Uh, is there one there? It might be even be, well, I guess you almost say this clo close by high right here on Thursday, but it gets through there a little bit, right? You would, this has room to move. It all has room to move. So that's the, uh, that's something that might not make a lot of sense to people, but the technicals say it's just, it's, it, it's bounced. But for now, as long as it hangs out above the 20, try to give it the benefit of the doubt. If it doesn't hold the 20 SMA, probably just ignore it uh, or unless you wanna go short it. Uh, let's see here, HYG, go through that one. <laughs> We've been looking at these. You can see, there you go. And there's your resistance line, right? They put in a higher low uh, versus here. They reverse it back above. They get the, uh, the action continues to be good. The SMA start to shoot up. Volumes picking up as it goes up. So again, you got to expect that. It's pretty much gotten to the 100. There's a little gap there. I would expect that to be your, probably for me, that would be your next area that it gets to, which is about a, up about a buck and a quarter. And then from there, probably going to be nice to say, there's probably some flat line activity right near 76.25 and there's 150 SMA. But that's, all, that's at 63. Probably a little bit vertical right now that you may be a little concerned on that initially. Uh, but again, if it pulls back mildly and then tries to go in, a, in the markets acting bullishly, you know, I would go with that too, just a little bit further. But again, not a big trader. So high yield, the high yield ETF. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there was, I think there was one more thing I really wanted to dive into before we wrapped up. But um, I think I might have to wrap it there. So my way of looking at it right now is that the, just the wrap up would be that, <clears throat> excuse me, the market's really, I think short term overbought uh, because of how the intraday cycles worked out at the end of uh, trading on Friday. But you got to give the bulls the benefit of the doubt until we get, unless there's news, of course, but until we get, the, uh, get to the Fed and then we see what happens with the Fed. You know, I would say the, 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 what I'm seeing, like the buying on bad news and not even caring, uh, there might be, it might be that gambit we've talked about a little bit with just under ill-footed or under, under invested, and they can use that to their advantage. And it might be a non, for a lot of people's minds, it might be a nonsensical rally if it happens. But I've seen them do this many times before. And um, all that really does is, prolong the the decline right because eventually people say okay this is the economic data is continuing to deteriorate globally there's all kinds of problems out there uh, rates are not going down anytime soon this economy is grinding to a halt inflation is more stubborn than uh, they they tried to act as if it would be that would be bulls i mean by that and uh this is rolling over again that's usually what would I've seen things like that that would help in terms of how it would play out in a scenario. But as of right now, I would say, look, they're willing to, they're more willing to buy right now than they are to sell. We could see that in several ways and it's across the board and I'm about to do sector situation, but I'll just flash this and you can see these are the 12 main sectors. And I, I've got a couple others that I follow, but most of them, as we noted last week, they did break out above our resistance lines in many cases, touch them and then went. And so there you go. It's kind of like the proof is in the pudding. We were saying, hey, give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, they've done a nice job here. It's actually looking pretty solid. Um, and they, and they, they took that potential they had and they ran with it. <clears throat> and some things are getting closer to overbought, but I'll cover that in sector situation. But bottom line is that all these sectors have jumped almost, I should say, all the sectors have jumped. And that's really indicative more like the risk on factor, right? And so just not seeing the seller sellers are stepping away at the moment the insiders are have have been buying the blackout periods ending there's plenty of money to get put to work a lot of people don't believe this sentiment's still not great on the aaii so give it uh, give it its due if the fed turns out to be neutral here's my take on it fed if the fed delivers bullishly bullish fed's neutral bullish 
And then otherwise bearish, I guess you'd have to say if the Fed really whack-a-moles the bulls in their pivot thesis one more time, I guess you have to still lean more towards being a bear at that point. Although uh, after what I've seen them ignore uh, lately, I'm not so sure I'd be super aggressive at the start of that bearish action. I might give it a little bit of time and wait for a little bit more confirmation. So hopefully something I've shared with you will help you out this week. And um, I do thank everyone for tuning in. And I hope to see everyone in the webinars and Rebel Pit, Cocktail Hour, through updates, so on and so forth. Thanks again.